Welcome to Higher Learning. I'm Van Lathan Jr. I'm Rachel Lynn Lindsay. Finals begin tonight. Actually, as when people have, will have heard this, we would have known. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, because it's Friday. But people mm-hmm. will have known mm-hmm. who won game one. Yeah. Uh, I feel like the Celtics will probably win game one. The Mavericks could steal one. Rachel, how are you feeling about your team being able to compete for a championship? It feels weird to not be in Dallas. I mean, I know the game tonight or the game Thursday is in Boston, but it feels weird to not be in Dallas because I'm sure the excitement and the energy is there. The last time Dallas won uh, or went to the finals and won in 2011, I was in the city. I went to the parade. It was a very exciting time. It was a very, it was electrifying. So it feels, I feel distant, but I'm excited nonetheless. I mean, it's great to see a Dallas team go the distance. I mean, the stars are too. Let me not count out the stars. I just don't watch hockey. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a fun time. How I'm many... kind of being a little bit of a bandwagon fan though. I'll be honest. Yeah, we know. Uh, <laughs> how many um, Mavericks championships are worth one Cowboys Super Bowl? <laughs> You mean like how many post Maver- 95? No, no. Yeah. Now, how many Mavericks championships would it take for the city to feel the same way about They're those not. championships as a Cowboys Super Bowl? There is not a number. The fan so, base the Cowboys right now, have. They can win me, 10, and we're still going to be waiting on the Cowboys. We're still going to be waiting. I'm so, sorry. It's the truth. Let's say the Mavericks won four in a row. Mm-hmm. Would you take four Mavericks championships in a row or let's say let's say it's five five Mavericks championships in a row or one Cowboys Super Bowl one <laughs> at this point I'm sorry and I think any real Cowboys Dallas Cowboys fans would say this is no dis- disrespect to the Mavs love the Mavs uh, but we've been waiting for almost 30 years for this to happen. So at this point, please, I would even take an NFC championship. I would would even take a Super Bowl win. I would take us just getting to the NFC championship and winning over four in a row. I would. So you're saying, wait, so you're saying (laughs) a Super Bowl appearance from the Cowboys. It's enough. It's enough. Would be more than five Mavericks championships in a row. After th- almost 30 years? Yes. Mm. I'm sorry. That's how much of a Real Cowboys talk. fan I am. And I think a lot of people would say that. We are t- like, and that's it. You're, you're making me go back on my word. I'm not talking about the Cowboys for this upcoming season. I'm mute. I don't want to say anything. I'm not making any predictions. I'm simply going to watch. That's it. Mm. I don't want to talk about them. I can't do it. It's interesting. Look, it is the thing. Once you start talking about them, then they're going to start to win. Watch. Rachel. No, I'm not. I'll tell you something right now. You're in a sneaky good sports spot. We haven't talked about it. Texas, playoff team, Mavericks, finals, stars. I mean, the Cowboys are obviously addicted to failure, but at the same time, they also are a pretty good team when you think about it. Yeah, but they got some issues they got to work out this summer because we're we're not doing too well in the offseason right now with how we're handling the team. So I, again, I'm not talking about it. I am not talking about it. But um, you're right. Texas sports are usually good. But, you know, we're entering new seasons. Texas Longhorns going to the SEC. We'll see how they, yeah. they do there. Totally different. They're going to be um, one of the best teams in the SEC. So you think Boston is going to win tonight? Who do you have for the entire championship? Uh, the, the the Celtics will probably win. I mean, America would love love to see uh, the Mavericks pull it off, and the Mavericks are playing so well. They're playing so well. It's hard to count them out, but if you just look at it, the the Celtics with a healthy Porzingis, it's going to be pretty difficult for the for the. Um, well, that's going to be the, the key. Yeah. We haven't seen Porzingis, Porzingis in a while, so what is he going to look like? That's, yeah. the, that's I mean, it. He was supposed to be back for the Eastern Conference Finals. You would think that since he didn't play in the Eastern Conference Finals, 
that he would be ready to play for the finals. Um, but you're right. That's an astute observation from sports rage. Uh, uh, you're right. Who knows how he's going to come back and what he's going to look like. It might take him a couple of games to get going. But the Celtics clicking on all cylinders, you know, they're the best team in the league. And I don't think anybody could beat them. They would be six or seven. But we'll see. The Mavs have been playing really well, well man. The Mavericks aren't supposed to be here. Everybody thought, myself included, OKC would beat them. Then you thought Minnesota would beat them. And now here they are. Yeah. So, you know, don't, don't count them out. I'm, I'm hoping it at least gets to game six, seven. We want to see a good championship series. Oh, no, I think I think six. I think it'll be six games. I can't see a sweep or a gentleman sweep here. Uh, I got trapped gas. Is that a diagnosis? Yeah, so look, I went to the urgent care yesterday. Um, it, it... I want people to make <laughs> a decision. Okay, so listen, I want people to make a decision. I'm serious. Either we want black men to take care of themselves in their 40s, or we don't. Okay. Was the pain that bad? Because I will say, I can be a gassy person. And, and like, you know. I, like it's troubled me since childhood. Yeah. So I'm saying this in the sense of like just pain, like not like letting it out, just like stomach GI issues. So, and that's I don't not go why, to the urgent care like that's that. That's not why I oh, went okay. to the urgent care. Okay. I went to the urgent care because I got a bump on my arm and I wanted to make sure it wasn't a staph infection. How bad was the bump? Okay, he's showing it to me and I don't see anything. I see skin, not a bump. Nothing's open. Um, I don't see anything that even looks like you would think it was like a spider bite. Where is it? Oh, see, I'm looking in the wrong spot, but still. That's what you thought was a staff? Please tell me it was bigger than that. It's gone down. It was a little bit redder yesterday. I wanted to make sure it wasn't okay, a Okay, so how did you go from that, thinking you had a staph infection, to trapped gas? How did we get because here? Because when I went there to get the staph infection checked out, because I wanted to make sure I, I looked up what could happen if you have a staph infection, and I don't want that to happen. And so I... And I have insurance, so all it costs was time, okay? And it made me think about all the Americans out there that don't have uh, health insurance and, you know, a lot of them are voting against their own interests. But we got to get people insured. Mm. This is a big mm. issue on the left. The right doesn't care about it. It's another thing that when you guys are saying all the sides are the same, they're not, but whatever. We'll table that conversation for right now. Mm. Um. Yeah, so I went there. I told them also, you know, sometimes, like when I swallow, I get pain in the middle of my chest. And the woman at this point is starting to get a little annoyed. And she goes, <laughs> uh, she looks at me and she's like, oh, have you been, you know, whatever. She's like, you're a little bloated. You got some trapped gas. So that's what it is. I got trapped gas. So they gave me something. It'd be a hell of a day here. Oh, gosh. Trapped gas. That's yeah, a thing. You know what? People have different ailments. Okay, I'm just like Bozeman. Bozeman has a skin ailment right now. We have ailments. Then you get them figured out, and then it works. Also, because I was on the road, I didn't go to the gym as much. Normally, the gym is where I get it all out, you know? I get that. Yeah. I get that. Your routine's um, messed up. Flying does that for you, too, though. Fly, at least it does for me. So, mm. yeah. It's a, you I, fought I, on the plane? Really throw you... Excuse me? You fought on the plane? No, I do not. You don't. And it is plane. my extreme. No, I do not. And it is mm. a huge pet peeve of mine when people mm. start doing that. Just yeah, like they just feel the freedom. With... They just feel the freedom to just do it as if like nobody will know. Nobody will know. Mm. It's the one time I almost came to blows with somebody on a plane. Yeah, it's it's serious. Go ahead, tell the story. Uh, I was Were on a plane, sitting next long to flight. They're sitting next to me. And I was like, yo, the next time you have to fart, could you please go to the bathroom? Is that too much to ask? <laughs> it was like, we're on the plane. It's, I'm sorry, man. I'm just having, I, I get it. Could you please go to the bathroom? But dude, I mean, humans fart. I'm like, I mean, this Ooh. was a bad one. This was a bad one. And get he looked up. like a farter. Mm. <laughs> and what might that look like? Farters, you can tell the farters. I can look at the women. We've talked about this before. 
I can look at the no, women. No, he is not. Oh, I can tell the women that are farters. I can tell the ones. It's in the eyes. It's something in the eyes? Okay, I think you're going to say that. <laughs> yeah, it's in the eyes. It's in the eyes. You can tell. The eyes have a certain gleam to them. I tell you what, a farter at, for, for being a woman, that's, you would rather have that. You would rather have a farter. Because? Because it's like, just be human. Let it out. Don't feel the daintiness. After a while, oh, sure, you don't want to fart on the first day. You don't want to fart on the second day. You don't want to fart. But like, just be yourself. It, there's, a, there's a little bit of confidence to it. No. That when you're a fart. I can, I can get up and go to the bathroom. Like mm -hmm. that's, it's, I'm not keeping it trapped in. I'm just going to excuse myself and go to a place where it should be let out. Outside, to the bathroom. It's yeah. just unnecessary. Anyway, okay, I'm, I can't do this conversation. Just move anymore. on. I just it's feel like I, feel, I just, I, I, I just feel like society has done so much, done a number on women. Y'all can't even fart. I can't even fart. We can. It's, it's fart. It's fart. Let's do it. We don't care. We can. We, like we don't care. It's funny to us. I actually don't find it. It's not funny, and I don't find it. Com I'm not comfortable doing it like that. Like I'd much rather pass gas in the appropriate place. It just, it doesn't do anything for me to just sit on the couch and just do it. I, it's, huh. I don't like it. I don't, I wouldn't Andy. do it by myself. I don't like that by myself. I'm get up. Different show for different folks. All right. Uh, look, you guys, we got a blast from the past coming up. Not the big deal of the day, but we're starting off with an apology rating on the other side of this break. Rachel's going to get us into it. All right. So you called it a blast from the past. Something that, to be honest, frankly, none of us asked for. Um, Michael Richards, you guys remember him? Kramer from Seinfeld. Well, he wrote a book. Uh, he has a new memoir out. It's called Interests, Entrances and Exits. Um, it came out on June 4th. And so he's doing the media rounds. And um, we haven't really seen him in a long time. And there's a reason why. In 2006, you'll remember that Michael Richards, maybe you don't, uh, he was at the Laugh Factory and he went on a bit of a rant. Uh, Ashley, do you have that for us? Shut up! 50 years ago, you had your own tied down with a fucking pork up your ass! <laughs> you can talk, you can talk, you can talk your brain down with a fucking roll his ass out, he's a nigger! He's a nigger! He's a nigger! Oh my god. A nigger, look, is a nigger! Ooh! Ooh! Alright, you see? It shocks you, it shocks you to see what's buried beneath your stupid motherfucker. What was it called for? It's not called for you to hear all my ass, you cheap motherfucker! You guys have been talking and talking and talking! <laughs> I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Van, this video first dropped from TMZ. You were at TMZ. Yeah, not during, not when this video dropped, but I know the story behind it. You weren't? No, I wasn't there then. That was 2006. I didn't get to TMZ until 2011. Oh, oh, okay. Um, mm -hmm. thought you were there for 2006. Um, all right. So, <laughs> we all remember when this happened, um, for the most part. I don't really want to get into talking about the racist rant in particular because I almost feel like we've even covered that on the show before for some reason. But a few days after, this was brought to us by Donnie. I never saw this. He went on Letterman to mm. apologize. And because Seinfeld had, I guess, asked Letterman for a favor for Michael Richards to come on there. He wasn't there in person. He was there by video. Seinfeld was there in person on the show with Letterman. Ashley, can you play the clip? We have him uh, live via satellite yes, from Los do. Angeles. Sorry, right, this do. should be Michael Richards. Michael, are you there? Yeah, I'm right here. Hi, Michael. Welcome to the show. Hello. Hi. How are you doing? I'm uh, not doing too good. Yeah. Why, why don't you explain exactly what happened for the folks who may not know? I, uh, I lost my temper on stage. I was at uh, a comedy club trying to uh, do my act, and I got heckled, and I, I, I took it badly and went into a, a rage. And uh, uh, said some pretty uh, 
nasty things to some Afro-Americans. A lot of trash talk and... Uh, Stop laughing. It's not funny. <laughs> and what, uh, what were the, uh, the, the, the... You were be actually being heckled or were they just talking and disturbing the act? Uh, that was going on too. Uh -huh. Van, mm. you laughed, you laughed, chuckled a little bit as uh, yeah. Michael Richards started to talk and address what had happened a couple of days before. The audience is laughing. If you're watching this on video, you can see that there is um, no emotion behind what my, he's like. His face is stone cold. He's talking just for the sake of talking is what it seems like. Um and maybe he was uncomfortable because he wasn't there. Maybe he had, I, I don't want to make excuses for him. Maybe the audience laughing was throwing him off. Seinfeld had to ask him to stop. Why were you laughing? Uh, number one, I remember it. I was watching it live. Mm -hmm. um, I was watching it live. And even when I was watching it live, uh, I just remember it's funny to hear him say Afro-Americans. <laughs> the, 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 it was an odd moment because at that point, the audience didn't know what to do. Seinfeld didn't know what to do. Hmm. No one thought it through. The audience didn't know what to do. When they see him, they're used to laughing, like Jerry Seinfeld said. And he was coming on there, bumbling and stumbling through an apology from one of the worst videos we had seen of racism in a long time. And it's just the awkwardness of the moment was funny. It was, it was funny. It was funny then, and it's still funny now. But don't you think that that's a sign of the times? The fact that, okay, sure, we've known him as Kramer. But in that rant at the Laugh Factory, that was not the Kramer that you watched for years on Seinfeld. That was Michael Richards talk, addressing Black people in his audience. True. So how, and that's the last uh, thing that you saw of him, right? Not mm -hmm. the episode of Seinfeld the last night. It was that rant. So at this point, he's shown you who he is. And I'm not talking to you in particular. I'm talking about that audience that it was awkward, but the only person who should have felt awkward is Michael Richards because he showed you who he really was or is. And I don't understand why laughing was the response. And I'm just thinking as I sit here, I'm like, is that just a sign of the times? People didn't take it seriously because even in the laugh factory, when he started off, the first time he says the word nigger, they laugh because mm -hmm. people don't know if it's a joke or not. But then 30 seconds in, it became evident that he was very serious in what he was saying as he kept going and going and going and justifying his actions for calling this black man in the audience a nigger. Why is there laughter? What's the confusion? What's the awkwardness for the audience? How could they even take what he, when he was on Letterman, how could they take that as a joke? The Letterman That would never just... have, that would never happen in 2024, by the way. Like no, no yeah. audience I'll just would be laugh. honest with you. The, letter, the Letterman clip is just funny. I'm Afro sorry. is the it, Afro. It, like the, the Letterman, the Letterman clip with him standing there, looking feeble, with Dave David Letterman not quite knowing how to play it, with Seinfeld there. Seinfeld was there to, I think, to prom to promote the Seinfeld DVD that was coming out because Seinfeld mm -hmm. on DVD was about to be a huge deal. It made Jerry Seinfeld like mega rich. I think he made like $250 million the first year or something like that. I can't remember. I remember it was a big deal when it was coming out. Um, and so everybody's there to do that and then they bring him on and even when it flashes to him, he looks so feeble. It's funny. Yeah, it does. It, 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 like the, the, the contrast was funny. It was funny. It was funny. And even watching it now, it's like a funny clip. I've seen clips of people apologizing for stuff and the shit sometimes is funny to me. Like it was funny. I said some pretty nasty trash talk to some Afro-Americans. It was so <laughs> it's unserious. It's, it's funny. <laughs> it's funny. I, look, I think he was trying to be serious, but what the fuck you gonna say? Like, <laughs> I was like, I remember, you know, I, look, what the fuck you gonna do? There's nothing you can say. You could say I'm sorry. Well, I mean, he did say that he was sorry, but that wasn't gonna be enough. Like, did, I, mean, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it doesn't, he's apologized several times. That, that wasn't going to be enough. Look, so he's got, a, he's got the book coming out and he's back. And so and the question back. is, what do you do with him now? You saw him on The View. I, I, saw, I saw that he was making the rounds on The View. We all know I'm a faithful view watcher. And it's 18 years later 
Mm-hmm. And this is how he responds when Sonny asks him about that racist rant. I don't believe in cancel culture. I believe in consequence culture. And you've paid a lot of consequences. Uh, indeed. So, so we understand that. And, and so let's go to your infamous racial tirade on stage at the Laugh Factory back in 20, uh, 2006. Mm-hmm. We all saw that. It went viral. You were being heckled by some black audience members. And you responded with racial slurs. Mm. What happened? Mm-hmm. Just what were you thinking? What happened? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, <sighs> I'm on stage with a microphone in my hand, uh, uh, doing an act, breaking in material. It's late at night. And a uh, man in the audience um, uh, made an announcement that <laughs> I, I'm, uh, I'm not funny. Mm. He doesn't think I'm very funny. and. I came back. Uh, now, f- first, I-, I must say, look, I- I'm not a normal man. Uh, <laughs> or uh, any of us? Well, you're a well, comedian. No, but yeah, I mean, as a comedian, really, yeah. you got yeah. it. Yeah. You got it. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of eccentricity going on in uh, my kind of comedy. And uh, certainly, I could never have created a, a character like Kramer right. without being slightly touched. Uh, <laughs> so um, <laughs> I went into character. Uh, and um, oh. I work in a comedy club environment where the N-word is used a lot. And I decided I would uh, let it loose. And uh, It's not used anymore. Those days are over. <laughs> For me, they certainly For are, yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, cancel con- c- culture, I, I canceled myself out. Yeah. Yes, you did. Years. Yeah, I'm, I'm out of it. There, when away. that rage uh, came about, and so it was I, rage. Well, like sure. Saying you're not funny. Yeah, and the rage is channeled into a character. I am trying to perform in in my own way at first, and that got me deeper into hell. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's not a right word to use, is it? Um, well, I felt I got hit, so I'm hitting back. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that person went low. I'm going lower. And uh, I'm very emotional about it. You see, I can still, I after 18 years, you can feel the... But this is the passion that I am. Maybe it's because I'm Italian. Maybe it's, You are? Yeah. yeah. Um, There's two things that bother me with that, which is why this is about to be a very low apology rating. Sure, he took himself out of Hollywood. Also, Hollywood really did kind of kick him out. Um, cancel culture was didn't exist back then, but... It was so outrageous that it was a wrap for Michael Richards at that point. Um, He says that he went into character. So my question immediately is, what character were you playing? You decided to step into, so a black man's heckling you, so you decided to step into the character of a racist. So is he saying that he's not a racist, he was playing a racist? To me, that sounds like an excuse. He was trying to be funny. He wasn't. Now he's saying, well, I was just acting as a character in this because that's what you do on stage or that's what I do. No, you don't get like that doesn't excuse your behavior. You have to have that in you to say that. It was so outrageous. It's not like he said it once. He continued to say it. He justified it. He then talked about hanging him upside down. Uh, That's the first thing he said 50 years ago, that that would be happening to that black man. Second thing he does is excuse what he did based on, well, that word is used in the comedy club. And it, Van, was it used by white people in the comedy club back in 2006? Because I'm not familiar with that. I'm, I don't know. I mean, I know that there's some white comics that use the N-word in their, in their, um, in their acts, but I'm, I don't know how widespread that was. And I don't know if it was used like that. Maybe they're talking about the word and it's a funny bit, not saying that that's okay. But in that way, where it's a racist rant, you -hmm. can't excuse you for using it because other comedians use it. And to my knowledge, it's mostly black people. And we don't even have to have that argument because we know there's a difference. So here we are 18 years later, and this is how you're responding to your racist rant. It's a one. Hmm. Um, Okay. Well, I mean, I didn't expect you to get a a high apology rating. This is what I would say. (laughs) Uh, This is the thing about the Michael Richards situation. 
I don't have any problem with Michael Richards coming out and being on The View. I don't have any problem with anyone no. who wants to support Michael Richards, whatever, whatever, whatever. It's a long time ago. Things happen. Um, let me tell you what I do have a problem with, though. So, in the aftermath of this, which I remember very well, uh, Michael Richards met with Jesse Jackson, you know, did the whole thing and all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, that didn't go far enough. Mm. And Clearly. what I have a problem with is always this stuff as it's volleyballed around for black people, um, but not for others. Like when we start throwing mm-hmm. around the slurs and stuff like that. I'll tell you what I mean. So Michael Richards says the N-word, and he's saying it because he's standing on stage and he's being interrupted by a heckler. And then he tells the heckler, like you said, 50 years ago, we'd have had you hanging from a fork, from a, from a, from a noose with a fork up your ass. 50 years ago, we'd have had you hanging from a noose with a fork up your ass. For what? For interrupting Michael Richards. Mm-hmm. So there was a time when you getting out of your body would mean that I could kill you. I'm assessing a power over you to take your life, to impose a very direct consequence on you. And I'm telling you with the microphone of a, in front of a bunch of people that I'm nostalgic for those days because that's what that implies. Hey, you're talking to me like this 50 years ago. I'd have had you hanging from... That right there is the thing that makes this... Michael Richards wants to go low. He didn't just go low. Right. He, in a sense, is paying the vision of the world that he would have wanted to see in that moment on stage. What you got to hear from Michael Richards is why you did that. Okay? Because I just got to be honest with you. When somebody black runs afoul of another community, you don't just get to say, I'm sorry. You don't just get to say, hey, I got attacked and I went low. They make you go get an advanced degree in the suffering of the group that you offended. They make you got to go to Auschwitz. You got to go to the LGBTQ community, which they are a part of us. So it's not a different community. They're, the LGBT community is a part of us. Hell, the Jewish community is a part of us, black Jews. Um, but whatever that that uh, that group is, you before you can go on the view, you don't just have to take the right pictures and say the right things. You have to go explore why that's in you. You have to do all of the intellectual and emotional work to exercise that out. And until people are okay with you have do- with you doing that. They don't accept you. Do you remember the list of things that the Brooklyn Nets management had for Kyrie Irving to do? Mm-hmm. Do you remember the list? Mm-hmm. The list was donating money. The list was doing this work. The list was talking to this. The list was all that. All of that. By the way, which, hey, that's how, if that's what it is, that's, how, that's what it is. Michael Richards, a couple days later, gets a platform on, um, on Letterman. David Letterman to apologize because Jerry Seinfeld is his friend. Later on, Michael Richards gets to be on Curb Your Enthusiasm, right? Poking fun at the whole thing. Funny episode of Curb. Poking fun at the whole thing, like running from black people in the episode of Curb because Larry David is his friend, right? I don't want the excoriation and uh, exile of Michael Richards in perpetuity. I couldn't care less about that. Sure. But I do want equal work to be done for my safety. That's it. it I don't want the excori. We were at TMZ one time, and uh, this was maybe like 2012, 2013. They got Michael Richards. He was walking around in Malibu or something like that. Camera guy walks up to TMZ, uh, walks up to Michael Richards, and puts a camera in his face. This is well, eight years after it, right? And he says, um, uh, do you apologize to the black community? And it was corny. 
I said on TV, then it was corny. He'd already apologized. And I said, I'll, I'd say then what I say now. You apologize. You're sorry. What else have you done? If Michael Richards would have been on The View and he would have talk, talked about like the work that he's had to do or the books that he's read or the people that he's connected with or how he has a deeper understanding of how what he said was violent and all of that stuff, hey, it's cool. He's just never been asked to do that. And I got to be honest with you guys, people that run a follow the black community are never asked to do that. Any ask Hulk Hogan to do that? I mean, like Hulk Hogan is gone for a little while. He says, I talked to a couple people, had a couple of phone calls. Time passes, say I'm sorry. Hulk Hogan back in the WWE. It's like, they don't have to, they want to make sure that there's not one bone in a black man's body that could really believe the things that he said. But with us, hey man, boom, boom, boom. If you look at all the comments, the comments are like, hey, this is 18 years ago. Uh, why are we bringing it up? And by the way, this that's is not a sincere apology. Yeah, it, th that's not completely unfair. The, the apology itself might be sincere. But the question was, was there any work that was done? And well, there's just no way to, to, to discern that because he's never spoken about it. Um, maybe that's in the book, but I don't know. Maybe it's it is kinda, in the book. Whatever. Yeah. But to me, I don't think that there has been any done based on that response that was just given. It's yeah. like enough time has passed. Let's move on. But mm. for all the people who are like, he apologized 18 years ago, nobody's asking him to apologize again. But he did write a book. So it's hey, going to come up. He was going to be asked about it. going to come up. Yeah. yeah he was going to yeah. be asked about it. Whatever. I'm not. Mm, it is what it is. Um, okay, look. We got a problem down there in Georgia. Georgia, we got a problem. Georgia Court of Appeals indefinitely pauses the election subversion conspiracy case against Donald Trump. All right. This happened on Wednesday. Uh, it's likely now that this case will not occur before the 2024 election. The court said that it, the case will be on hold until a panel of judges rules on whether Fonnie Willis, who is, of course, the Fulton County District Attorney, should be disqualified. Disqualified. Now, uh, there was a mini trial, basically what amounted to a mini trial, uh, earlier this year where uh, it was decided that Fonnie Willis could continue to be on the case. A hearing. As long, uh, a hearing, as long as, uh, basically it was a mini trial. It was a hearing, but it was like a little mini trial. Um, it, I, I get it. But like, look, it's like, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's like, uh, Superior George, Superior Judge Scott McAfee had said that um, as long as Nathan Wade stepped down, that Fonnie Willis could stay on. Um, he made that determination, they appealed. And the Court of Appeals uh, is now ruling on Fonnie Willis being able to stay on the case. This means that Trump's day in court, Justice for Donald Trump, is delayed until Fonnie Willis is deemed appropriate for the case. Legal Eagle Fly here. What you got? I mean, listen. <laughs> I get that Trump's defense is going out. We've talked about it multiple times on this podcast. I understand why they're going after her. I understand they're trying to poke holes in her case. I understand that they're even more motivated to do it because of what she looks like. Um, and they know that she's an easy target, easier target in the court of public opinion and to make their case about him being targeted because she is a black woman. I get all of that. I'm still extremely frustrated with Fani. I she am. Fuck this. Why? Like why? So, why is it, why is I it okay? I'm she... not going to make the people always say, "Oh, Rachel takes up for black women," and of course I do. But I'm sorry. You have to call out Fani for her behavior in this. This is a case that was a strong case. Still is a strong case. I mean, it, as far as like it goes for the RICO charges, this was. The biggest case in in her career, and then you're gonna fumble it because of the appearance of what looks like a conflict of interest. Do I think there's a conflict of interest? No, which is why I believe the judge said she could stay on. He put the ball in her court and he said, You can stay on this case as long as Nathan Wade resigns, which he immediately did. But then they appealed it or they went to the court of appeals and still are saying that she should be disqualified from this case 
you know, they're saying it's a conflict of interest. I do not believe there's a conflict of interest because nothing that she did in regards to Nathan Wade could prejudice the case against Trump and the well, other defendants. She, I know what she's what they're what they're saying is that just so we're we're uh, being specific, they're saying that she benefited financially from it. Right. Yes. Because Nathan Wade paid for vacations that they went on together. Right. Right. And they're saying ba- essentially a kickback from her lead prosecutor. Now, the yes. judge said that that's not a big deal, but the appeals court Because it doesn't looks at prejudice it the case, is the point. Right. It doesn't prejudice the case against Trump and the other defendants. And a court of appeals will determine this. They have, I think I saw until March of next year to make their decision, which they could make it before. But the whole point of it is this case will now not be heard before the election, which was a big deal. It's a state case. Um, you know, if he was found guilty, he would have to face the sentencing, whatever it would be in Georgia, which was a big deal. Um, so I just, I'm upset. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not going to be one of these people who talks about what they're, how they're targeting her for being a black woman. There is some sort of responsibility and you can call it unfair. You can say it's unfair. She's being held to a completely different standard that if she was a white man, they probably wouldn't have gone after her. Yes, I've seen the argument also made that why are we not doing the same thing for the Supreme Court justices whose wives were involved in the overturning of the election, whose wives have are linked to that? I understand all of that, but it doesn't still excuse the fact that she fucked up here. Mm. She did. I'm sorry. She did. It might not be fair. I don't think it is. And it shouldn't allow her from being able, she should be on this case. I mean, I've said before that she should remove herself from the case, but she should have been able to do this case. She also, (laughs) she should, she should. When all this came out, I was like, remove her from the case so we can move this case forward. I did say that and I stand by that. She shouldn't have to. It doesn't, like, she didn't do anything wrong, but it is the way that it looks and it allows people to question her integrity. And when you are a black woman, or a black person, your integrity is on trial as well. And it's not fair, but that is how we are funk, how we have to navigate society. And we know that going into these situations. I'm mad at her. Couldn't agree more. It's gonna be unpopular. Um, but let me tell you something. We keep hearing about how important all of this stuff is. If it's that important, treat it like it's an is an important case. Now. Look, let's lay it out so people know. Number one, Nathan Wade was not Fannie Willis's first choice to be the lead prosecutor on it. She, uh, according to her, I'm sure you guys all watched the mini trial. We're hearing, as Rachel said, um, wasn't her first choice to 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 be on there. Um, but he ended up becoming the lead prosecutor there. If we are talking about this stuff as is as important as what we say it is, then we have to treat it as such. We have to be buttoned up. We have to be ready to go. I'm not saying that Fonnie Willis has to do anything more than what a regular uh, non-black woman district attorney would do. Regular. Oh, my God. Leave that in. That's such a bad way to say that. Leave it in. I think I take my, not regular. When I say regular, I mean in their eyes. Excuse me. We are regular. We are average Americans. We are Americans. Apologize about that. But what I'm saying is she certainly can't make an error in judgment that's this easy for them to pick apart. I I completely reject that you have to be pristine, that you have to be uh, completely above reproach and you have to talk the right way and be polite and do all of that stuff and you have to but this type of error in judgment Mm -hmm. is fucking catnip for them Mm -hmm. and it allows the conversation to be moved to her and not to what we are what we're supposed to be talking about and anybody that's making the argument differently the identity politics are rotting your brain. I'm all for identity politics. I think identity matters in America. You would be stupid if you didn't come to that determination. Of course it matters. But 
in a situation where we need to put the ball in the end zone, where we need accountability, you just have to do better than what she did. You can't give them that. And that's just the real. That's just the fucking real, man. That's yeah. just the real. Do I think that Fonnie Willis is, is, is a bad uh, DA? No. Don't think that she's a bad DA. Do I think that Fonnie Willis is, is, a, is a strong woman who would prosecute the hell out of this case? Yes. Yes, I do. But I also think she fucked up. Shouldn't have done it. Shouldn't have done it. We said it here before. Dumb off dick. It, 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 she shouldn't <laughs> have done it. And he shouldn't have done it. Yeah. Nathan Wade shouldn't have done it. Very true. It's not just on her. She's in the leadership position in that situation, but it's not just on her. One of them should have said, we can get to the fucking after we've put the ball across the, uh, across the goal line. They had to have talked about this. Like, they had to have known it was a possibility that this information could come out. Like, whether they did anything wrong or not, they had to have talked about it. So I just don't understand how it continued to move forward. But, you know, here we are. Here we are. Steve, uh, Steve Bannon headed to jail. Did you see this? Mm-mm. Steve Bannon headed to jail. Like he, he must report to jail um, uh, pretty soon. I mean, it, anybody who ever fucking spoke to Donald Trump is going to prison at this point. You want to jail, man. <laughs> There's a Lego Pharrell Shabbat Williams Trump's... movie coming out. We're getting off. They're doing Pharrell Williams' biopic as a Lego movie. It's called Piece by Piece. That's a choice. You like Lego? You like Lego movies? You see Lego Batman? No, not. I've never seen one Lego movie. Why? Do you like animated films? We've never talked about this. Yeah, I like Disney. What do you like to watch? I mean, I haven't really watched an animated film in a long time. Um, I, I watched Across the um, Spider-Verse. Oh, oh, yeah, you did. You, do, you did. And I loved that. it. And I loved it. Rachel, I give back me your top the first five one. Pixar films. I start mixing up Pixar and Disney. I got to look what's Pixar and what's Disney. Okay, Pixar so you're going to do films. it. You're going to do it. I'll, it's going to get done. I want your top five Pixar I films. Say, oh, oh, okay. Soul. I you love Soul. loved, loved Soul. Yeah. I don't know if I've really seen, I'm looking at what a, these Pixar movies, and I haven't seen uh, Finding Dory. I mean, Finding Nemo. You saw Finding Nemo. Of course, Toy Story, the first Toy one. Toy Story. Mm -hmm. That's three? Yeah. I haven't really seen these. I'm looking at them. Hmm. I have not really seen Pixar. I've only seen three. Uh, Sausage Party. I've seen. That's not a Pixar movie. <laughs> That's what it says. Wait, Sausage says it Party? Is. No. It says it is. Hell no. That's not a fucking Pixar movie. Sausage, that was that raunchy shit. Yeah, that, um, it was bad. I think I walked out of the theater. I liked it, but that's not a Pixar movie. It's listed under it Pixar. Funny. It's definitely not a Pixar movie. <laughs> I typed in top Pixar movies. And it listed it's definitely Sausage not a Pixar Party. movie at all. No way. No fucking way. Um, it's not. <laughs> Google's did, wrong. Did you ever see Wally? Uh, no. That's my favorite Pixar movie. Loved it. Loved it. These movies make maybe me cry. I, it's hard to watch. Yeah, I mean, maybe I saw Wally, but maybe not the whole thing. Soul made me cry. Yeah. You never saw I The Incredibles? No, I never did. Interesting. Okay, we'll, we'll get you in some of the Pixar movies. I'm Interesting. Bored with this conversation. Interesting. Um, look, uh, we have to talk about the Fearless Fund and Edward Blum being back at it again. And that leads us to something that, that we got into uh, on the old Twitter sphere. Um, mm -hmm, now, mm -hmm. just to let you guys know, Edward Blum 
has successfully blocked the Fearless Fund from issuing grants to only black women. The U.S. Court of Appeals in the for the 11th Circuit has blocked a black-owned venture capitalist fund uh, firm from awarding gra- grants exclusively to black women. In an opinion released Monday, the judges ruled that the Fearless Fund's Strivers Grant Contest is substantially likely to violate the provisions of Title 42 of the U.S. Code, which ensures equal rights under the law and prohibits the use of race when awarding and enforcing, enforcing contracts. Um, and now, of course, you guys didn't know what the, in case you guys didn't know what the Fearless Fund is, it is a group it's a, of, of black women down there in, in Georgia. It is a fund um, that uh, was looking to shrink the financial gap in tech. For all the women that get grants in tech, I think there's like, it's less than 1% of women that get grants in tech. We don't get, we don't get any tech money, we don't get any venture capital money for tech stuff. So they were, they started a fund. Um, they didn't ask for any affirmative action. They didn't ask for any handouts from the government. They started their own fund. Arian Simone, the founding partner of the Fearless Fund, started their own fund to directly impact a problem with that they see with black women in tech to fund these women. They started their own thing. Okay, for all of you, all you niggas do is go out and ask for handouts. Not what happened. They started their <laughs> own thing. They, I just have to keep saying that, okay? Because all we hear about uh, is bootstraps. Pick yourself up by your bootstraps. This woman and her fund decided to build the boots, build the straps, and then pull other black women up by those boots and straps. And then a white man, Edward Blum, uh, a legal activist who you guys know has also struck down affirmative action, also helped roll back voting rights, a gentleman who is backed by about four different billionaires that are helping him do that, decided that he would come in and destroy these women's right to do that. He burned the boots off of their feet. Hmm. And he was successful. Mm-hmm. Ms. Simone spoke. I am shattered for every girl of color who has a dream but will grow up in a nation determined not to give her a shot to live it. On their behalf, we will turn the pain into purpose and fight with all of our might. America is supposed to be a nation where one has the freedom to achieve, the freedom to earn, and the freedom to prosper. Yet when we have attempted to level the playing field for underrepresented groups, our freedoms were stifled. Rachel, last time I checked, you're a black lady. What do you think? It's just so upsetting. Mm -hmm. Um, There's literally no evidence other than your pure hatred to see a demographic that doesn't look like you succeed or even just be on an even playing field. That's your entire motivation. There's no evidence that any racial group is suffering by what the Fearless Fund is doing. And the only people who are going to suffer are the ones who are already suffering. I mean, the reason this was created is because there is proof There has been a lot of evidence and complaints of discrimination when it comes to getting money or for venture capitalists to invest in black startups. And all you've said it already. I don't even have to reiterate it. This is all the Fearless Fund was trying to do. And not even with these insane amounts of money, just enough to help them get on their feet. Just a small effort to do that. And here comes Edward Blum, motivated by hate. Bloom, excuse me. Motivated. Is it Blum or Bloom? I'm Why can't sure. I get <laughs> Edward Blum? I don't know. Whatever. There's no respect Blum on this man's Blum, name. Blum, I don't Blum, give a Blum, fuck. Sure There's no yeah. res- respect. Motivated by pure hate and his own self-interest. <clears throat> All this is going to do is create a trickle-down effect where companies in the private sector are going to be scared about the legal challenges that may face them with a decision like this. And what will start to happen is they will continue to eliminate their DEI efforts for fear of litigation. That's what's going to happen, which is the goal, which is exactly what this Edward man wants to do. And it's just a really sad day. And obviously, 
The laws existed. We have discrimination laws for a reason, because things aren't equal. And if there's evidence to show that that is still the case in certain industries, then how can an Edward Bloom and his efforts succeed? I just don't understand how something like this can happen. And he's con- and it's continuing to. Who's up next? Who's up next? Who's going to get it next? He's two for two. Oh, he's in what more than two for two. He got voting rights too. Like he's he's um Oh yeah, voting rights. The I forgot to forget. Every yeah, time like, he no, has gone he's doing up, his thing. Yeah. he's successful at it. Yeah. And it just puts the fear in everybody else. And we'll continue to see opportunities get eliminated for people of color. And we're just gonna keep sliding backwards. Hmm. So it's interesting. Um he is the biggest enemy to black Americans, uh, the advancement of black people right now that I can think of in the country. Far bigger than any presidential candidate. Uh, he is actually making the lives of black people difficult and harder. He is. There are people that might have been able to go to Harvard that won't go because of him. There are uh, black women who are would, be, would have been funded in tech that won't be funded because of him. There are people that would have been able to vote that won't be able to vote because of him. We're talking about his pursuit to strangle life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for black people. What it means to be a full American citizen. We're talking about voting. We're talking about uh, making money. um, And we're talking about access to higher education. Um, He has decided that he will make sure that... um, Anything that tries to address the systemic and intrinsic inequality in the American system um, that affects black people, that he will try to strike it down. And he'll use the billion dollars that he has at his disposal um, and the law itself and weaponize that against black people. All right, so it's a conversation that I was having over on the old internets that, um, that relates to this. Uh, so... The Donald Trump thing started to go a little bit viral on the internet. We talked about it on the last podcast. And, and, and somebody asked me, I thought it was a, a sincere question. They said, sincerely, Van, what do you want white people to do? What do black people want from white people? Genuinely curious. That's not the question I'm going to respond to. I'm going to respond to a response to that question. So I responded to the question, what do black people want from white people? I said, to stay out of the way. Now, first of all, let me tell you why I answered the question like that. I don't, I told you before, I don't believe in allyship. Yes, you have. I believe in doing what you can. Okay? I believe in doing what you can. I believe in, hey, you know what? You're in a position to help. If you can help, help. I don't believe in asking people Hey, you gotta help me. You gotta do this, or else you're not a good person. Because I don't think people are, are, um, are, are, are wired that way. I personally think that what you do for people and what you do for yourself is based upon the principle uh, that you have and your vision of the world. Rachel, how you how do you view the world? What do you mean? Like, what do you That's think? That's such a general question. Like, how do you view the world? How do you view the place of human beings in the world? What do you want to see for people? Oh, what do I want to see from people? Um, this is such a hard question to answer. I mean, I guess in the simplest terms, I want to see people be more selfless. I want to see people actually care about needs that aren't their own. Mm-hmm. I don't know. And like, yes, we do it to a point, but you know, it, yeah, it could be hard to care about everybody's needs. But I, in general, I would love to see people care about things that don't just benefit themselves. Mm. I don't know. It's a, it's very hard. Like it's a very general question. So I'm. I get it. It is a, a simple answer. Question. Um, the way I answer the question is, I want to see full free participation and expression for everyone. Everyone equally. Okay? 
And if you truly feel that way, you can't help but get involved in other people's struggle. If you want to see, if you want to live the best life for yourself, that's pretty easy. And a lot of people are like that, and that's fine. I don't have a problem if you're like that. I want to see the best life for everyone. So because I want to see the best life for everyone, that means the only way to, to affect that is to care. All right? Sure. That's the only way. Um, that undergirds everything that I think. The fact that I don't want anybody to just be born into a situation where they're fucked up. I just don't, I mean, look, we can talk about what re what's realistic and what's not, but I just don't, I like the thought of just being born into a situation where you're fucked up. You didn't do anything to ask for it. You didn't do anything to, to bring it on to yourself. It's just fucked, right? So let's try to make mm -hmm. life the best we can for people, and especially when we have the resources to do it. So back to this question, what do black people want from white people? I say to stay out of the way. All right, boom. Got a lot of responses from that. Uh, one response was from a guy named Cowboy Keeks on X, at Cowboy Keeks. I actually appreciated the response. I'm sure some people would be mad at him, but not me. It said, except when it comes to abolishing slavery, civil rights act, ad revenue, podcast sub subscriptions, and consumerism, right? That's what he said. All right. I think that that response deserved a response from me here on the podcast. Because I think okay. people are confused at what people mean when you say stay out of the way. Stay out of the way. Sure. Right. He took this, this response to mean don't participate. Right. It's not what was said. Now, now let's take the Civil Rights Act. Let's take the Civil Rights Act. Passing the Civil Rights Act is staying out of the way. It's staying out of the way of Black Americans full participation as American citizens. See, let's break this down. We, by birthright and by our toil in this country, are guaranteed certain rights. The system in America, segregation, Jim Crow, whatever, whatever you have it, more entrenched and insidious small things, was in the way. Was in the way of us going to the same colleges. Was in the way of us voting was in the way of our economic advancement. The system was in the way. Not asking you to give us anything we didn't earn, asking you to stay out of the way of our full participation in America. So you know what we did? We marched, we disrupted, we organized, and we made it to where America didn't have a choice but to get out of the way. We pulled America out of the way. We did that. We pulled America out of the way as much as we could. I'm not saying that they're totally out of the way, but as much as we could. That's what I'm talking about. When you're talking about the fearless fund, nobody went, and this, this right here is not about going to ask somebody for $500 million and not getting it. This is about you making your own way and white people doing what they always do whenever black people seek their own self-determination in this country, they said no. Do you know what being in the way is? Bombing Tulsa. You know what being in the way is? Urban renewal. Being in the way is every time we say, you know what, we'll do it on our own, saying, nah, remember who you are. This is the hierarchy in America that must remain. This is the hierarchy in America that must exist. And this is the way we want it. This is the way it's going to be. All mm -hmm. of the things that he named here, abolishing slavery. What? <laughs> That's the worst one. <laughs> That's the worst one he put. What? What? The, uh, what? Once again, all of you guys do your work in terms of how black people affected the end of slavery in this country. What happened, what had to happen, who was there, the black people that worked, all of that work is done to get this country out of the way to our future. If you don't want to post a black square in your Instagram, don't fucking post it. Don't fucking post it. But when I start some shit for myself, don't ask me why I got to be black. 
when I start the black, 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 black organization, don't ask why it got to only be for black people. I'm not asking you guys for anything. I'm just asking you to stay out of the way of my everything. Like, that's it. So, yeah. look, everybody out there, I absolve you. The ones <laughs> that want to read, I, I do. The ones that want to read Bell Hooks and want to read books and want to do all of that other stuff, I love you so much. Happy the tent's big enough for all of the allies. But for the, the rest of y'all, just live y'all white-ass lives and stay the fuck out of our business. Like, I'm, I'm just being for real. Like, just just do, like, just stay the fuck, like, look, when I, say, when I say that, I don't mean we can't party together and we can't fucking uh, watch Star Wars together and all of that, but when we doing something, just stay the fuck out the way. That's it. It's, re it's, really, it's really that simple. I'm not saying segregate. I'm not saying this. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying when we do what it is that we're doing for each other, don't cut the legs off of it. And people think the story of America, of Black people in America, is the story of Black people not being able to get it right. That's wrong. Mm. Yeah. The story of America is of white people. The system here in this country destroying the right that we've got. Yeah. And that's just a fact. I would have answered it, and it's pretty much what you're saying, maybe a little softer, because I do believe in allies. Um, I would say stop fighting against us, which is pretty much your same sentiment, but that's probably how what my answer would have been. Stop actively fighting against us. That's the best thing that you could do. If we're doing our thing, we're pulling ourselves up, or we're fighting for our rights, or we're expressing things that, you know, would empower us, don't fight against that. Don't do things to disempower us. Don't look at it as, oh, we're going to be better than you, or we're building ourselves up, and you're, you're going to be in this situation, and we're going to be, like, don't look at it like that. Just don't fight against it. That's what I would say. What can white people do for us? Don't fight against it. What do black people want from white people is the question. Oh, to not fight against us. What we're doing. Stay out the way. That's how I would say. That's how I would say it. Nah, just because you got too many of them uh, one nigga nights. It's the same sentiment. <laughs> it's the, I forgot about that. It's the same sentiment. It's the same sentiment. Stop actively fighting against us. By the way, look, man. It's harsh, but the reality is this. Love a good ally. I just don't trust allyship. Allyship. Do to you me, consider yourself to be an ally to other disproportionate groups? Not really. Okay. Because I, I can myself, sworn you, we've we called ourselves allies to the queer community before. See, I I, I don't think. I don't think that I could really call myself an ally. Um, I, so I'll tell you about this about black LGBTQ people. LGBTQ people, period. But particularly black ones. I can't really be an ally to black LGBTQ people because I am them. I'm not of their community, but they're of mine. Like, we black. I care about what happens to you. I just, this is that simple. You're, you're like, we're, we're black. I care about what happens to you. Like, I care about what happens. Like, I don't, I don't need to make an extra special dispensation because you say that another black person is treating you poorly. You're getting pe treated poorly in the church. You're getting treated poorly here. You show up for me. I show up for you. That's what we do. I mean, Ally, yeah, I guess I just care what happens to you. And I'm not going to always get it right. I think a lot of times this, uh, all of this, this, this talk about allyship and all of this stuff, I feel like it's cosmetic. Because well, of the, course, the, for some people it is, but not everybody. I know not everyone, but it's like, it's man, what it all comes back to, to me, 
And the reason why I don't really believe in allyship is because, like, what are you willing to sacrifice? Because it's always going to cost you something. Like, what are you willing to sacrifice? Like, what, like, what, it, it's not about, it, it, it's always about what we can achieve together. But sometimes it's about what we don't do. I'm sure Colin Kaepernick and Nessa are sitting somewhere right now thinking that they don't have very many allies. Because when push came to shove, a lot of people weren't r- willing to turn off the NFL for them. Sure. I think there are a lot of women out there that feel like they don't have any allies because when push comes to shove, a lot of men aren't willing to change their behavior for them. And the reality is, it's like, if most of the people that say they care about something, I mean, they're looking out for number one. We're human beings. So what I would prefer is we all have honest conversations about how we see the world, what that means. We do the best that we can. But more than anything, we don't impede each other's progress. Because in, inside of that impeding each other's progress is, to me, the competition that makes these, this intersectionality um, a lot harder than it should be sometimes. So if you're asking me, what can you do for me? When I start something from black, for black people, don't ask why it got to be for black people. Because I'll tell you why. Because y'all not going to fuck with us. But we got proof. Okay? And I'm going to work with plenty of white people. Work with white people all the time. And a lot of them don't feel this yeah. way. Um, all, all I'm saying is just stay out of the way of our advancement. If you want to participate in our, our advancement, fine. That's an ally. We will always disagree about this ally thing. Sometimes I think you just fight against words for the sake of fighting against words and the definition of them. But nah, I can't be like, like for, for, for at example, the beginning of the, say, at the beginning of, one second, just real quick. Now, nah, you know what? I'm sorry. I apologize for putting you up. Go ahead. At, when I said we have referred to ourselves as allies to be a part of the queer, um, in regards to the queer community, and you say, well, they're of us. They're in our community. Yes. There are queer black people, but I don't know. Just like I don't know what it is to be a black man. I don't know what it is to walk life as a queer person. So the best thing that I can do is offer my support in their ongoing effort, you know, for what they're fighting for. And I think that you need that of people who aren't like minded like you, who aren't all um, who aren't fighting for the same rights because that is the group you belong in. I think you need help assistance from people on the outside who desire to see you have equality in the exact same way that they do. That's why I will always say it. I think an ally is not somebody who gets in the way and fights against it. I think an ally is someone who wants to support, who's seeking understanding uh, because they don't understand that person's everyday struggle. So I will always say that that is necessary in the fight to change whatever it is, whatever's fighting against them. Like you need people who are different to help you in the fight. That's just my thing. Um, But don't hinder, but don't hinder it. And I think a lot of times, I do think a lot of allyship is performative because it's the popular or the trendy thing, trendy thing. And I think that people don't take the time to research or understand what it is that that group is going through. They just attack because they don't oppose it. They just attach the label onto it. And I think that that can be problematic in the grand scheme of things. So I understand what you're saying, but I will always say that allies are necessary. And we can always just agree to disagree when yeah, it comes to that. Yeah, we can agree to disagree. I just think the trough of people has to get big, right? It's it's not black people against white supremacy and then the allies of black people that are against, that are against white supremacy. It's people that are against white supremacy. It's not gay people that are against homophobia and then the allies of gay people that are against homophobia. It's people that are against homophobia, right? When the whole, uh, when the Gaza war started, we got a masterclass on people who looked at allyship as transactional. Because there were glitches in worldview into how some people viewed the world and how other people viewed the world. And what we think uh, humanity, well, it just there were glitches in it. Got masterclass in it. And so all of that stuff says, hey, there's a fundamental way you look at stuff. To your point, you're right. 
There's a fundamental way you look at stuff. And if you think treating people is wrong because of who they go to bed with, then you think people who is you think it's wrong. Mm-hmm. You know? Like, so if you don't think it's wrong, then fucking go over there. If you don't care, if you think it's wrong, but you don't care to be involved, then just chill. I get what you're saying. In the, in the grand scheme of things, you're right. I'm just disillusioned. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. So, uh, heavy show today. We got to go. Short one, though. Um, look, man. I thought you had a question for me. No? Oh, I do have a question. a question. Oh, I do. Ooh, 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 ooh. I do. Thank you for reminding me. Okay, so uh, my good friend Candace was talking about this on um, on uh, on on Twitter. Okay, so let me not Twitter on Instagram. I got to ask you this. So this Candace is the scenario. Candace Bimbo. Okay, I thought you were trying to be funny. Like it was like a Candace Owens thing. No. You, okay. you think about her a lot. Are you ever going to fight Hannah B? We, we've we been through this. Keep going. Give me the question. I saw her. And no. Um, okay. So this was the question. So a friend of hers that was dating a man. Okay. And things weren't exclusive. It wasn't really serious. But the man would not invite her over to his house. Mm. He had slept over her house twice. Okay. And after a while, she was thinking about maybe becoming more serious with him. But he wouldn't invite her over to his house. Did she ask him why? She did. He said it was because he didn't like people over to his house until things were serious. She thought maybe he had roommates or maybe he lived in the shitty part of town in the hood or, of course, the dreaded dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun. So, her friends, she wasn't with them, but her friends decided that after a date one day, after she went back home, they would follow him home. You like that type of shit, though. I love this. Keep going. See? It's See, just funny. I just, I just, you, 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 you did that type of shit. You fucked that. I didn't that. say I agree. I just, it's funny to me. Okay, so they follow him home. And he lived in a homeless shelter. Oh. Now, do you see that response from Rachel? That is a response from a real feeling an emotionally deep human being. Did you see that response from her? I was not expecting that. Like, that really makes no. me sad. Of course. Oh, my God. I'm about to get pissed. Of course it does. Of course it makes you sad. Of course it's sad. Is this the wrong... Was this... What was the response that they had? I... I... Killing this nigga. Oh, no. No. Killing this nigga. Now, I look, I get it. Okay, so let's, let's be real. He did lie. Yeah, of course he did. <laughs> of course he lied. Oh, my God, man. <laughs> Rachel, you're the illest. Like, it, 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 he did lie. He lied. He lied. He definitely lied. But I watched in the comments. I actually went back and deleted my comments. I watched in the comments. Candace is always triggering me. We got to have her on the podcast. I watched in the comments. And I, and I saw it and I typed in the comments. I was like, guys, I know that it's frustrating. I know. But is there like not anyone here who has just like a slight bit of compassion for this guy? He was taking her out. He was paying for dates. He was, like, I, I, I did that. He was paying for dates. He was doing all of this stuff. He wasn't acting an ass or doing anything. He was just down and out, living, had a car for whatever reason. He was just, he had to be in a homeless shelter at this particular time. And I'm like, I get it. I know it's fucked up. I know we're all super jaded by the internet. But that's like a sitcom episode where the girl is like, I can't believe it. Did you find out at the end? I'm like, is there no compassion? That's a, that's a, what if you were in that situation and you find out he was in a homeless shelter? It makes me so sad 
Because I was going to ask you, is he paying for dates? How is he getting to the dates? Um, he obviously is in a down period in his life and is trying to get back on his feet. And the way, I mean, I can make the argument both ways. My initial reaction okay. was sympathy because that's sad to me that he couldn't be, he didn't, he couldn't be his full self and couldn't be honest because he was afraid of this, this type of judgment. I also would like to preface this conversation that my therapist says that I have broken wing syndrome. And I, (laughs) (laughs) this is important for context. So immediately that is my response. I want to help this person. I constantly date people that I can help, that I see potential in, that I'm like, oh, I can fix this. We, It's going to be a great, so we can be better. Like, I want to help you. I almost want to need to feel needed. It's a problem. So I want to say that, that I have a problematic way sometimes in the going into relationships. So it's quite natural for me to have this type of response because I'm like, how can I help this man? Would I continue to date him once I knew he lived in the homeless shelter? No, I'm in a different place in my life, but I would also be his friend. I'm in a place where I like, in my current situation, I cannot do that. That's not good for me, but I would want to figure out immediately how I could help him. I'd want to understand his situation. I wouldn't be anger. I wouldn't be angry at the fact that he lied. I would understand his lie. It would be frustrating to me, especially if I really liked him, but, um, I would understand. I would understand it better. I'm sorry. I would not date him though. Let me be clear. Okay. On that, okay, because I for just, me, it, I, can, I can't do that right now. But, you know, if he was living there because, you know, this could be a this could be a pursuit of happiness situation. It could be all kinds of situations, man. It's just see. But that's the, that's what I tell myself. That's a broken wing syndrome. I'm like, you know look, what? He could be. Pursued look, I just look at certain stuff as like when I look at stuff, I'm like, yo, we're talking about how we want to treat and show up for unhoused people. And then the minute it happened, I'm just talking, see, this is the ally shit I'm talking about. You just never know. You just never know. Everyone says it until they're in the situation. But it was funny because I I, I got on my soapbox, which I have to stop doing. I got on my soapbox. But then after I I got off the soapbox, I'm like, yo, man, come on, man. We, We this fucked up. Like, and I'll bring Candace on. So she can talk about it because I'm sure she'll be nonplussed about us discussing it on here um, without the full context. Because so, me and her talked about it. I was like, yeah, it's like, you know, I'm like, come on, man. Come My on, other argument, through. though, would be you need to save your money. Like it is a little it's slightly problematic that you're living in a homeless shelter and you're taking somebody out on dates. You're not in a position where you need to be dating people. That is the other side of it that I will so say. So do you think that homeless people can't find companionship? I, I'm just saying you need to be smart. No, absolutely they can. But you have to be smart about how you're spending your money because you're obviously saving your money to be in a better situation. LA is expensive. I'm assuming she's in LA. It's not in LA. Okay. Well, going out is expensive. You have it drinks, is. you have dinner, you got to use the gas to get there. I'm just saying be a little bit more financially responsible. A picnic, a walk. Those can also be romantic, but not spending as much money. If you're homeless, I just would be more careful about how I'm spending my money. That's it. That's the only argument I'll make on the other side. Shout out to all the homeless people out there, the unhoused people out there. You deserve love, too. I won't let society look down on you and treat you this way. I don't think it's fair. Now. It's. She, it's not. If she doesn't want to date him. Fine. But right, I just thought exactly. a lot of those, a lot of those comments. Wow. You understand why he lies, and, no, and there's no excuse for lying. But my heart sank when you said that. See, like, and see, that's what it's, I, when it's, I it's, at, it's, when I looked at it. That's what I was when I looked at it. I was like, man, what the fuck, man? This motherfucker. What? He he was a nice guy of all of this stuff and they they followed them home god damn okay we got <laughs> but that's what girlfriends do and i'm not i'm not even mad at that part i'm not what even mad at them following number one home detective lady agency shit is like that's what we do i'm not even mad about that 
And this is how I know I still got issues because a part of me was like, I'll take that young man on the team. See, <laughs> we gotta go. Take thing caps off. Do not stop learning. <laughs> I, I need help. I'm Rachel. I'm dead serious too. I'm Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs>